Hi everyone, uh, today's lecture is going to be about the English School or, or sometimes called um, uh, International Society Theory and uh, um, so the first, if, if we were face to face um, uh, I would ask the class is, so is the international system at the moment an anarchy or a hierarchy? So the answer is really, um, it depends what time you're looking and where you're looking. So at the start of the Cold War, you really had a bipolar world uh, with, with one pole being uh, the Soviet Union and the other being the US. And then we, within their spheres of influence, their decisions really carried uh, the day, right? Um, so within within their poles, within their spheres of influence, you could you could say that at the at you know in nineteen fifty, um, uh, there was a hierarchy within the the um, the Soviet sphere, uh, and definitely a hierarchy within the um, uh, the Western sphere. Right. So you can say that it's that during the Cold War it was hierarchical, but what about between the U.S. and the Soviet Union? Right. What's the what's that system? Well, uh, an anarchy, right? Because there's no higher power to suppress violence, to to make decisions, to to enforce rules. Right. So between the um, the two sides, you, you, you're you still in an anarchical system. But does anarchy mean uh, there's a complete lack of order? So the insight of the English school theory or the international society theory is that that even in a anarchical system where there is no hierarchy, there is no uh, higher power like a pope or something able to uh, make decisions, um, uh, even in a completely multipolar world, uh, anarchy doesn't mean that there is complete disarray and disorder. There is actually order in the chaos, right? Um, that and the English school's insight is that even in an anarchy, you have unwritten rules that uh, guide behaviour. And uh, so, what would be if if we were face to face? I would be asking, what are some of the official rules of this course? And I, I would hopefully get some sort of answers like um, that uh, uh, you have to hand up assignments on time, uh, you have to write an essay with so many words, you know, basically what's in the topic guide. Right? But there's a whole lot of unwritten rules as well. Right? Um, in, you know, tons and tons, right? That we that are hard to actually put into words sometimes, but um, one of those rules might be that if we're in an auditorium, uh, you're not allowed to sit on each other's laps, right? Or you don't come to the front and sit down, uh, you know, or start playing with uh, my computer, or you know, um, uh, you're quiet when I, when the teacher's trying to speak, and um, you know, there's no, uh, you know. So these sort of unwritten rules, right? Plus, like you're not allowed to bribe me, you're not allowed to cheat, you know, these sort of things. Um, so these rules aren't written down, you know, sitting, not sitting on each other's laps or kissing or something while the, the course is going on. But everyone knows them, right? It would be, it would be shocking. It would be surprising if someone thought that sitting on someone else's lap and kissing during a lecture um, uh, or at least a face-to-face -face lecture uh, would be acceptable, right? Like everyone knows that that wouldn't be acceptable behaviour. So there's 
the 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 point is is that the underlying institution of this particular course uh, in that there's a whole lot of rules and, and institutions that are part of our society right so there's there's core and secondary right um, written rules and then unwritten rules and that's the insight of of the English school in that um, they see that there's still order and a sense of rules even in an anarchy so um, the English school uh, talks about the difference between an international system and an international society and Hedley Bull is um, one of the, the main writers there. And so let me read to you his definitions. Right? An international system of states is formed when two or more states have sufficient contact between them and have sufficient impact on one another's decisions to cause them to behave, at least in some measure, as parts of a whole. Right? So that's when you have an international system. So very... Uh, so not not um, very tight, not very tight knit uh, contact, but enough for uh, decisions to affect each other. Right? Whereas, uh, on the other hand, you you have an international society of states exists when a group of states, conscious of certain common interests and common values form a society in the sense that they conceive themselves to be bound by a common set of rules in their relations with one another and share in the working of common institutions. International society is a political and social fact attested to by the diplomatic system, diplomatic society, the acceptance of international law and writings of international lawyers, and also uh, by a certain instinct for sociability. Right, so one, one whose effects are widely diffused amongst all individuals from tourist curiosity to a deep sense of kinship with all men, right, or all mankind, or humankind, I should say. So a system is simply contact between states and not much more, whereas an international society implies a uh, a set of social rules and institutions and understanding uh, understandings about what is appropriate behavior let me read this um, uh, quote from from uh, Hedley Bull a common feature of these historical international societies is that they were all founded upon a common culture or civilization or at least some elements of such a civilization a common language a, a common epistemology so that's that means uh, an understanding of what knowledge is, so science, an understanding of the universe, a common religion, a common ethical code, a common aesthetic or artistic tradition. What do you, what do you think some of the historical international societies Bull might be referring to here might be? Well, um, the uh, maybe uh, European, um, you know, uh, uh, Christendom, even after it broke up into its different um, uh, popes and, uh, you know, the Great Schism. And, and even then, when you had um, uh, the Protestant um, Revolution, you still had a common set of understandings about, uh, you know, what things are appropriate, right? Um, and within the Chinese um, uh, empires or um, throughout history, right, the 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 uh, the essence isn't a set of written rules. It's a it's a common understanding of how the world should work and what's appropriate. Okay. All right, so these are some of the goals or shared understandings uh, of the current society of states. Um, and so this, this is Hedley Bull's argument that uh, 
even though we're in an anarchy at the moment, there is still a, a um, set of institutions, unwritten rules, um, uh, and maybe even some written rules that, that create order. And so this is some of the, the goals or shared understandings of our current society of states. Number one, preservation of the system and the society of states itself. So this means resisting empire or other challenges to the supremacy of the state. Um, number two, so so there so there you'll have a you know balancing coalition against you know an aggressive state or something like that, right? So there's that balance of power uh, kind of theory in there. Number two, maintain their individual independence and sovereignty, right? So survival. Right? Number three. Peace as the normal state of affairs, um, especially now that uh, warfare has become so costly and destructive. Um, the the goal of you know military strategy now is to not fight wars rather than trying to win them more. Uh, number four, so limiting violence, even if um, you know, so uh, um, together we're not allowing piracy or things like that, right? Number five, stabilization of possession by rules of property. So um, unless you have, you know, uh, um, a common understanding of what is um, ownership, then that will that will kind of um, suppress trade and you know uh, make things very difficult. Number six, keeping treaties, contracts, and agreements. Right? Um, if there is a state that that uh, repeatedly breaks treaties, breaks contracts, breaks agreements, um, that that country becomes a bit of a pariah, a bit of an outcast because they can't be trusted. Right. Um, and that, and that, even from generation to generation, um, governments are very reluctant to uh, break a treaty or break a contract um, because it, it's, um, it will, it can damage their uh, their ability to enter into other treaties um, or to get other people to enter into treaties with them. And last one is mutual recognition of sovereignty, right? So this, we have a, a system of sovereign states. Um, so we, there, there's a limit to how much we, we can interfere with each other. Um, that's, the, that's the system we have. Okay, so Bull, Bull and um, Martin Wright, the, the English school says that um, we, there are certain institutions in this society of states. Right? So in 1977, in Bull's book, uh, he, he argued that the balance of power, international law, diplomacy, great power um, uh, concerts, so cooperation, or, or the great powers get to decide things, right? Um, uh, China and the US being great powers are going to have more say uh, in you know global uh, events than you know Fiji or something uh, and war. So in seventy seven, Bull Bull argued that even war is an institution for settling disputes and things like that. Uh, though it wasn't much longer. So in 1984, he, he changed uh, war to international organisations. So the, um, the institutions that uh, in the um, English school uh, argues is, is sort of uh, providing order to our anarchy is that there's a balance of power or there's a balance of power will be maintained, right? You have balancing coalitions and things like that against in, um, aggressors. International law, diplomacy, great power cooperation and, and um, 
primacy and international organizations so things like the UN WTO um, Asian Investment Bank things like that um, maybe even um, the uh, one belt one road right creating order even though it's there's an anarchy so Martin White uh, wrote on institutions let just let me read this bit to you that that by institutions I do not mean determinate organizations housed in determinate buildings such as the League of Nations in the Palace of the Nations or the United Nations in the East River building but instead recognized and established usages governing the relations between individuals or groups so such as marriage or property or alternatively enduring complex integrated organized behavior patterns through which social control can be exerted and by means of which the fundamental social desires or needs are met so uh, the marriage the marriage um, uh, reference is is really interesting in that uh, in most societies there is a set of rules surrounding how to get married right the process maybe you have to register with the state maybe you have to have a certain um, celebrant or priest or something or and there's some words you have to say or whatever right um, but there's also also a stack of unwritten rules right it's um, you know maybe it's uh, maybe it's poor form not to wear white or maybe or to wear black or something or or um, you know th there's all the rituals that aren't actually written down they're just they're just um, social patterns right? so even though it's the institution of marriage has written some written rules or you know very small ones it's still surrounded by all these other um, unwritten rules okay so here's some um, further uh, further institutions that have been um, proposed uh, by different um, English school writers right so so sovereignty so it's non-intervention and there's uh, law governing um, states relationships territorial territoriality and diplomacy so this is um, so there's boundaries right and the and the uh, boundaries are really quite set now all right it's not it's not um, it's not okay to for us to go to Africa and sell it set up a new colony or something like that right uh, bilateralism and multilateralism right so this di diplomatic um, engagement negotiating if you've uh, you've probably you would have done my international commercial law course uh, and in that I, I you should have come to an understanding of how much cooperation is happening at the you know in the underpinnings of the the global um, trade system right we everyone has a um, representative at different organizations um, uh, you know um, negotiating what laws are going to apply right great power management so this is alliances and war and a balance of power this is like the military um, aspect of of things so the English school saying these are actually institutions right there's some written rules but there's also a, a bunch of unwritten rules and the point of them is to provide order and and a way of doing things that is that is uh, at least a little bit routine or um, understandable equality of people so there's human rights and humanitarian intervention especially since the end of the Cold War uh, uh, that's been um, the the UN has become much more involved in humanitarian interventions the the Chinese um, 
are a, a major um, uh, supplier of uh, military forces for for lots of humanitarian missions, um, and the market. So the trade liberalisation, financial liberalisation. Um, there's sort of a hegemonic stability about the market, which is pretty well universally uh, accepted now, where trade liberalisation uh, is is uh, the norm. Nationalism, right? So self-determination uh, and sovereignty, maybe democracy, um, different forms of it, obviously, um, and environmental stewardship as a as an institution, maybe a, a a, for, a newly forming one where we are going to have to, or at least the great powers like uh, China and the US and others are going to have to uh, uh, solve the, the climate crisis um, cooperatively. Right? So all of these, are, are uh, the English school argues, are are institutions like marriages for for you know people to people all of these are institutions state to state right? but there's a lot of debate uh, and differing opinions as to uh, what are the the institutions um, and what might be the the unwritten rules that are uh, attached to them and that's because um, that the English school is interpretive in its approach. Right? Uh, do you remember this slide from uh, from last lecture? This slide here. So uh, this is uh, so I I put into the last lecture um, the positivist or behavioralist uh, the the scientific approach to um, to studying politics. And so let me just read this through again, uh, because this is this is the opposite of what the international, the English school believes. Right. So this is the positivist approach. Number one, research can discover uniformities in human behavior Two, these uniformities could be confirmed by empirical tests and measurements. Number three, quantitative data is the highest quality and should be analyzed statistically. Number four, political science should be empirical and predictive, downplaying the philosophical and historical dimensions. Number five, objective, value-free research is the ideal. So you're not supposed to be arguing for one, uh, one type of good life over another. Right? And number six, social sciences should search for a macro theory covering all social sciences as opposed to normative issues of practical reform. And so the methods, uh, the methods used in the positivist behavioralist uh, uh, tradition is sampling and interviewing, scoring, scaling, statistical analysis, uh, and experiments that are repeatable. Okay. But uh, let me read to you what Headley Bull thinks of these two approaches, right? Two approaches to the theory of international relations at present compete for our attention. The first of these I will call the classical approach, the, the approach theorizing that derives from philosophy, history and law and is characterized above all by explicit reliance upon the exercise of judgment and by the assumption that if we confine ourselves to strict standards of verification and proof, there is very little of significance that can be said about international relations. The second approach I shall call the scientific one. In using this name for this second approach, however, it is the aspirations of those who adopt it that I have in mind rather than their performance. By confining themselves to what can be logically or mathematically proven or verified according to strict procedures, the practitioners of the scientific approach are denying themselves the only instruments that are presently available for coming to grips with the substance of the subject. So the English school is interpretive, right? What, what matters is the subjective ideas of key players at any particular time. Right? 
not um, not universal rules. This is very uh, um, context dependent. Okay. So the English school theorists think that uh, the neo the structural realists, the neo um, realists, and the uh, neoliberal institutionalists. Uh, who follow a very positivist scientific approach, uh, the, the English school thinks that they, uh, they miss most of what is, what is happening in politics and in society, in, in human society, in interactions, because objective facts don't matter that much, right? Counting the number of bombs uh, like uh, realists do, and deciding who is the threat because who's got the most bombs, uh, misses the point. The the point that their objective facts don't matter. It's subjective facts. It's the meaning of those bombs. Those bombs could be part of an alliance and protect us. Right. So the context is everything. The so the. So the English school is mildly constructivist in its um, in its methodology. Right? Uh, it's really the, the the mildest of the constructivist theories. We'll look at that next lecture. But uh, they the English school believes that uh, society is constructed um, out of the all these unwritten rules. Right? So the next point is that the English school is also normative, right? uh, as well as interpretive. The English school takes inspiration from the idea of the natural law and the social contract that comes out of that. We, we talked about the social contract idea when I covered the Enlightenment thinkers. Um, the English school takes its cue in particular from the 17th century lawyer, judge, ambassador, Hugo Grotius, um, so this is him at 25 and 45. Uh, so if you remember, he published uh, uh, a book in 1638 um, that who set out the idea of a, a system of sovereign but equal states, um, and it became the basis of the uh, Westphalian treaties that ended the Hundred Years' War, uh, Protestant Reformation Wars, um, and created the state system that we have today. Right? And so during this period of cataclysmic warfare that threatened to end European civilization completely, Grotius is writing about this society of states, an international society, that's governed not by force, but by the rule of laws, laws that everyone has mutually agreed to uh, enforce. So not an empire, but a society of states. These ideas uh, were his most important um, in, in his book on law, on the law of war and peace. Um, in the, so there's actually three books in the series. In, in the first book, he explains his conception of war and natural justice, arguing that sometimes war is just, but most of the time it's not. Right? In his second book, he identifies three causes for war, self-defense, uh, reprobation, reprobation of injury, and punishment. And the third book is about rules to govern war while, while it's being fought. So he argues that all parties are bound by bound to these rules of contact during war, whether the, the, the war is just or not. Right? So just because you're in the right doesn't mean you can avoid uh, losing by breaking the rules, so killing civilians or something like that. So Grotius's ideas um, really created the, the Treaty of Westphalia. Um, and But do you think Grotius's Grotius's ideas could have been tested empirically before being implemented. No, right? Of course not, right? And that's that's so much of uh, 
of political philosophy and and politics we we're trying to create a good life um, uh, the best organization the best way of dealing with things and and so the neoliberals and the neo uh, realists and the positivists lock themselves into things that can only be they they only believe anything that if you can count it and do some sort of uh, correlation analysis right so the the english school thinks that they're they're missing the whole point of of studying uh, politics in that the point of politics is to make a better life right like grotius did uh, he saw a way to end this war and to create an entirely different system right? a system that we still operate under today and hopefully you'll remember from last lecture that uh, we talked about uh, john locke uh, countering uh, hobbes's uh, argument that we needed absolute uh, kings uh, with an argument that all men are born with certain inalienable rights and so Locke argued that there were three natural rights life equality and property right? and the role of government is to protect those rights and crucially the government doesn't need absolute power to protect those rights and in fact becomes a danger to them if it does have those absolute powers so so Locke's idea of natural rights being the basis upon which we can rationally build a, a structure of a, a society um, comes in large part from Grotius. Uh, Grotius used, used it to argue uh, that we can structure the peace between states upon a common interest and a rights of all mankind in life, liberty and property. Grotius's idea of sovereignty of states translated to Locke's idea of the sovereignty of the individual. So being the key inspiration for the Peace of Westphalia, it is really kind of a big deal, right? Um, and it reordered how we think about international relations away from religions fighting to conquer the world for God to independent uh, states um, and religion becoming just a private matter for, for individuals, right? So this is how Grotius was described by one historian uh, of the Enlightenment thinkers. Let me, let me read you this. Into the very midst of this welter of evil, at a point in time to all appearance hopeless, at a point in space apparently defenceless, in a nation of which every man, woman and child was under the sentence of death from its sovereign, was born a man who wrought as no other has ever done for redemption of civilization from the main cause of all that misery. Who thought out for all, for Europe the precepts of right reason in international law, who made them heard, who gave a noble change to the course of human affairs, whose thoughts, reasonings, suggestions and appeals produced an, in, an environment in which came an evolution of humanity that still continues. So Grotius, right? Pretty big deal. Um, pretty big deal. Okay, so the next thing that we I need to introduce you to, if you're uh, to get an understanding of what the English school uh, is and believes, there's um, there is a debate within within the English school. Uh, over the Westphalian um, idea of sovereignty, right? So even though uh, the uh, the English school is continuing the work of um, Grotius in in many ways, and that's well, that's how they feel. Um, there is a division over it. So the pluralists believe that the society of states is a plurality where there will be all sorts of states some dictatorships, some democracies, some theocracies, and just like the Peace of Westphalia enshrined, we do not have the right to enforce our beliefs on other states. The pluralists believe that co coexistence only requires a minimum of mutual interests. 
whereas the solidaritists uh, believe the individual that individual humans as well as states are members of an international society and as such uh, we have some common responsibility concerning the welfare and security of individuals even if they are not in our state so the debates that are happening uh, elsewhere about sovereignty versus say the the responsibility to protect um so or you know if you haven't heard of that phrase the responsibility for us to intervene to stop um, genocides or civil wars or things like that um uh, so that's all that's really the same debate between the pluralists and the and um solidarists uh, uh. so uh this is so you probably haven't you you might not have heard of the um uh r2p or the uh, responsibility to protect doctrine um proposed a few years ago uh, at the un um that saying that uh well here, here's the um here's the doctrine let me read this to you number one a state has a responsibility responsibility to protect its population from genocide war crimes crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing number two the international community has a responsibility to assist the state to fulfill its primary responsibility number three if the state manifestly fails to protect its citizens from the four above mass atrocities and peaceful measures measures have failed the international community has the responsibility to intervene through coercive measures such as economic sanctions military intervention is considered the last resort so uh the this um this doctrine has been proposed in the un um i'm not sure how well, probably 20 years ago now but and the debate um is the same as what's happening in the english school between uh the the solidarists and the um uh the um, pluralists in that how much responsibility do we have for individuals in other states right. so signatories to these two conventions so actually sorry i should ask what what do you think the difference between uh the convention on genocide or the or even the universal declaration of human rights um is but what is the difference between the responsibility to protect doctrine and those two conventions well um signatories to the two conventions right the the um, convention on genocide and the universal declaration of human rights what these two declarations um do is that people the countries that sign them agree to make those things illegal in their own states what these two declarations do not do is give other states the right to invade if gen genocide or human rights violations are occurring all right whereas the responsibility to protect doctrine if it was ever fully enacted by the, the un would give states that right, right in fact it would make it a responsibility uh, so it would would be a major change to the grotius um, idea of sovereignty and um, uh, so the problem at the moment is with the convention on genocide and the universal declaration of human rights is that if a state commits genocide or human rights violations then in international law they are supposed supposed to arrest and and prosecute themselves right <laughs> um so that's the problem right but uh the responsibility to protect doctrine would completely overturn sovereignty and make it a responsibility for the international um, uh, society to step in to stop um, these these four atrocities 
So this debate within uh, the English school about the responsibility to protect. Uh, so initially, uh, most, most people that were watching when this concept was floated uh, were strongly in favour of it. And so, for example, you would have uh, NATO peacekeepers going into Bosnia, or currently you've, we've got uh, Chinese peacekeepers in South Sudan. So China is actually a um, probably the second largest now uh, contributor to peacekeeping operations, right? And so it's hard to it's hard to argue that going in and stopping human rights abuses, genocide, uh, you know. Um, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, you know, these sort of mass atrocities against civilians. Uh, it's hard to argue that that's a bad idea. Right? <clears throat> but the pluralists in, in, uh, in the English school do argue that it is a bad idea. So the Pluralists would say that if 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 sovereignty is not an absolute that cannot be cannot be broken, right? If if um, if borders cannot be rewritten, or you know, this I, this this concept of non-interference in other states, if that's not an absolute, then a sneaky invader can use the four loopholes, right? So uh, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And ethnic cleansing to legalize an invasion. Right? For example, Russia arms some rebels in Ukraine, or maybe sends its own troops in wearing civilian clothes. And when the Ukrainian government fights back, Russia declares that they have committed war crimes, so maybe killing civilians, or uh, you know, and the, and so Russia sends in peacekeeping peacekeepers then they have a referendum which they rig and the territory is split off uh, from Ukraine so this is sort of what's happened in Crimea uh, and if if sovereignty isn't an absolute then that's the kind of thing that will will happen right? plus some would say that Westphalia made it illegal to use religion as a justification for invasion Right. So religion is is any sort of moral code. Human rights is another moral code, right? and and it's a moral code that's at the heart of the the responsibility responsibility to protect doctrine. Some might disagree that we can uh, that we can agree that our conception of human rights is a universal code. I don't agree with that, but that would be some people's argument, right? That we, we can't uh, allow any sort of moral code to be, to be used again as a justification for invasion. Right. Um, though, <laughs> the governments making that sort of argument are usually governments that are committing lots of human rights violations. But, you know, anyway. I should say that the English school doesn't say that rules can't be enforced using war, okay? Uh, war was one of Bull's original core institutions. And Bull argued that war is limited by international society's rules, but also used to enforce uh, international law and maintain the balance of power even. Uh, so, uh, and it can be used to change international law. Uh, I mean, presumably with opposition, right? But so the option is there, and it, and that's still debated within the English school. Uh, Bull says that order is more important than justice, which is um, which is interesting. So, um, the I'll finish off with uh, Bull's alternatives to he to the society of states, right? Um, so one is a world government, uh, but even he 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 thinks that is very unlikely, uh, and uh, especially especially in a world with um, nuclear weapons, uh, you're not going to be be able to have a 
an empire uh, or perhaps um, you know we all follow the EU, EU's example and and hand over political authority to um, to a, a super state and that might become a world government maybe or maybe our um, maybe our uh, our free trade agreements get so complex that um, uh, international arbitration of things that just sort of becomes the norm maybe but he also has this other uh, other conceivable alternative to the um, the current system of a, a society of states and what he calls new medievalism let me read this to you it is also conceivable that sovereign states might disappear and be replaced not by a world government but by a modern secular equivalent of the kind of universal political organization that existed in Western Christendom in the Middle Ages. In that system, no ruler or state was sovereign in the sense of being supreme over a given territory and a given segment of the Christian population. Each had to share authority with vassals beneath and with the Pope and in Germany and Italy, the Holy Roman Empire above them. The universal political order of, the Western, of Western Christendom represents an alternative to the system of states that does not yet embody, uh, you know, does not have to have a universal government. Right. So that that is another alternative. And you could maybe see that um, if you take the European Union as a as a template, you could see how our our free trade agreements and the expansion of say international commercial law um, and expansion into um, consumer protections uh, and once you sort of you know if these if these treaties if these if this um, commercial laws uh, um, trade agreements are, becomes more and more complex they require uh, submitting to arbitration Right, and that arbitration can kind of become um, uh, this um, interplay of of uh, authority, right? So s the state system it breaks down a little, or it doesn't break down. It, it gives over power to a more interconnected um, legal system right? so maybe a uh, new medievalism is uh, what we'll call it okay so that is um, okay that is uh, uh, the English school um, the next lecture will move into uh, more uh, more constructivist um, theories where uh, they're dealing with this concept of unwritten rules, um, rules about what is appropriate behaviour, um, and and the constructivists feel that or argue that they are the really important rules, right? The written rules aren't the important ones; it's the unwritten rules that control us as individuals and societies. Uh, and and I I all. I feel that the English school is like the most conservative of the constructivist theories, right? Um, okay, so I'll leave it there. I, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, stay safe, stay well. See you next lecture.